is filled with cryptids, ancient history, and mysteries. And I spent a lot of time looking at the petroglyphs in Utah and their locations, trying to decipher the meaning behind some of them. And I did come to some ideas, and I really tried to focus on cryptid petroglyphs and the locations of them, just to try to understand their purpose and meaning and the intentions behind them. And I really had my hands full with this one because Arizona, New Mexico, they have amazing petroglyphs. Every state has amazing petroglyphs, but Utah, there's a lot going on in Utah with these petroglyphs. And I wanna talk about what I found out and the petroglyphs and their locations and the cryptids in Utah. If you share in my interest in cryptids, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the like for this video. I really do appreciate it. Obviously, I didn't get to all of them, but I really wanted to focus on, like I said, the cryptid petroglyphs, and I wanted to familiarize myself with the location of these petroglyphs because I found that I think that's really important. I didn't just look at all of the Utah petroglyphs as a whole. I really wanted to learn about the locations of the petroglyphs. And so obviously I really was only able to look at the big major petroglyph sites, which there are a lot. There's also just a lot of smaller sites as well. But I really wanted to find out who made these petroglyphs. And I learned that the northern half of Utah the ancient history and creators of those petroglyphs were the Fremont. And the southern half of Utah, that was occupied by the Anasazi. Okay, I have heard about some of these Anasazi sites. Okay, like Mesa Verde, Hoven Weep, and Cowboy Wash. And I have to dedicate a whole video to that. I'm not going to really be mentioning the Anasazi in this video because I'm focusing on the Fremont. So I'm going to be skipping everything about the Anasazi and saving that for another video because I want to look look deeper into what happened at some of these Anasazi sites and look into the disappearance. So I did find out some interesting things though about the Fremont and the Anasazi that coincide, which are the dates of their disappearance, 1300. This is also the arrival of the Native Americans. I'm going to go ahead and say it's not a coincidence. But let me tell you, I didn't know anything about the Fremont. So what I first did was I put in, I put in the search, Fremont people, BC, Utah. And according to history2goutah.gov, the first signs of the Fremont started as early as 100 BC, duly noted. Then I went on to the next search, which was what happened to the Fremont people in Utah. And according to utahstories.com from a 2012 article called Ancient Fremont Farming in Utah, and I quote, Fremont Indians of Utah adopted farming technology that would be wiped out by their conquerors, the Ute, around 1250 to 1300 AD. And it says, the Fremont Indians culture vanished in less than a century. They were alive for, so now I'm not quoting anymore. So, they were alive for a thousand, for like a thousand years, and then in less than 50, gone. From what I studied um, in my videos about the Anasazi in New Mexico and Arizona, the disappearance of the Anasazi was also in the 1300s, and so was the arrival of the Navajo skinwalkers who did not like the Anasazi and called them ancient enemies. So, all signs point to problems when the newcomers, the Native Americans, the new Native Americans arrived. Because there were already people here before the, um, before the Native Americans arrived, but the question is, were the Anasazi, were the Fremont all one species, or were they different 
species because there's reports of some very tall Anasazi in Galena, New Mexico. And there's some reports of very short Anasazi in other places. So, and according to the petroglyphs, we're not really sure if the Anasazi or the Fremont were 100% human. You know, you think about the Neanderthals, they were kind of human. They weren't animals. So I think that the Fremont and the Anasazi were not animals, not quite human. And I don't think that was, I think that caused a lot of fear to the newcomers who apparently were uh, much better skilled in war. Some of these tribes that came to new to to the United States were very focused on war. They were warrior tribes. They fought with other Native American tribes and they took it upon themselves to just fight. They were warriors. And I'm sh pretty sure that, you know, everything seems to be falling in line for that being the cause of the disappearance, more like the fleeing of both the Anasazi and the Fremont. And all the dates line up. It makes sense in every area that that's what happened. But again, this is my opinion because it is technically still a mystery as to what happened to the Fremont and the Anasazi, but I found some things out. All that being said, it's not personal, it's just ancient history. I mean, I don't hold anybody responsible for what their parents did, let alone what their ancestors did. I mean, it's all about what you do today. So I just want to make that clear as I continue talking about this ancient history in Utah. So now I'm going to kind of go over Utah. It's got some of the most amazing scenery. They've been beautiful throughout ancient history and I'm sure we're appreciated like we appreciate them today. So starting in the southwest is the legendary Zion National Park and moving east is Bryce. Moving east and to the south in south central Utah is Lake Powell that extends from the Arizona border up into Utah and then this Lake Powell has many it extends and forms the Anasazi Canyon, along with many other deep river canyon valleys where there are a lot of petroglyph, ancient petroglyph sites and high hanging hidden cliff dwellings. The ruins continue up into canyon lands and north of that is the famous Moab. And Moab is central to the majestic landscapes in the arches, canyon lands, and it's also a dinosaur hotspot. It seems that giants and dinosaurs tended to go together, which doesn't sound like a big stretch, but it is for some. And here's more evidence of that because when searching for giants in Utah, I found one single story that I'm going to bring up because it is, I've never heard anything like this before or seen anything like this before. This is called, this is about the Moab man or the Malachite man because there were these skeletons found on um, the one, the Moab man is 12 feet tall. So he's a giant. There were like a hundred of them, but this one Moab man, he was buried in a azurite mine and the only reason that they found these skeletons is because they used dynamite to blow up this hard sediment. The other skeletons were over six feet tall. They were buried in deep, hard sediment. The sediment, which was we, they were able to test, is 140 million years old. And therefore, the bones in these sediment, buried deep in this sediment, would also have to be 140 million years old. And yes, they did radiocarbon dating testing on these bones, but they came the, the tests came back inconclusive. And it's a fact that 
radiocarbon testing gets really bad in the mill after like millions of years, you know, because the atmosphere when there were dinosaurs was very likely different. The gravity was different. So the bones are made out of malachite. They turned into malachite. So I had to start searching like how is malachite formed? It's formed with copper, but I've seen malachite and it doesn't even look anything like this. This looks like jade. It looks like like very glass and his bones turned into malachite and there was a jawbone found that it turned into turquoise. So I searched for turquoise fossils. I found more evidence of turquoise fossils than I did of malachite fossils, but yes, never anything this large. But did they do something to the bodies? Like maybe they wrapped them in some thin copper, put them in this azurite mine. Did they know that they were going to turn into malachite? And turquoise? I could turn into turquoise? I think that's fascinating. And so the controversy and all the talk isn't so much focused on how did these bones turn into malachite and turquoise. Mostly it's focused on how old they are. And they're trying to say that they're, this other opposition is trying to say that they're 200 years old, made by the Native American Indians, giants. I mean, how long does it take for a jawbone to turn to turquoise? But I just found that totally fascinating. Of all these petroglyph sites and of all the many cryptid petroglyphs in Utah, how is it then possible that I have chosen a group of petroglyphs to be my absolute favorite favorite? And those are going to be the McConkie Ranch, also the McKee, the Cub, and the, the Chew. They're in the same area in northeastern Utah. And then the Nine Mile petroglyphs, very amazing as well, my favorites. I, I do love like Sago Canyon. I mean, I love them all, don't get me wrong. But the reason I chose the McConkey Ranch petroglyphs as my favorite is because I'm gonna tell you what I think. I think that this is where the toughest bravest cryptids, maybe the Fremonts, probably, I think, took a stand against the humans. They took a stand and they made these huge petroglyphs that are like almost bigger than life size. It's, I think that they showed themselves holding heads of the Native Americans, but what I think happened after that is that the Native Americans saw these petroglyphs and did some Gra graffiti changed them to make the, to reverse it so that the cryptids heads were being held and that the Native Americans were the ones holding the heads. And I don't think this happened on all of them, but I think that that happened. But I think originally that the cryptids did try to make a stand here against the um, Native Americans. Obviously they lost, but I believe they're still here. They're still there. You know why? Because directly under that is Skinwalker Ranch. And the Navajo were enemies to these cryptids. And the Navajo said, this land is cursed. Well, of course they think it's cursed. Their enemies are there. And then the Utes, they get, they get sent. And they have to stay in this area where, uh, trust me, they're probably not welcome. And this was a long time ago, you know, because there's still cryptids there. But I believe that in order to survive, the cryptids had to go into hiding and make the make people believe that they were all killed so they can stop looking for them and trying to kill them. They had to hide. And I believe they hid here, and they're still here, hidden. So let's talk about Skinwalker Ranch. So at Skinwalker Ranch, there's so much paranormal activity going on that they have 24-hour surveillance, security, and very high-tech monitoring systems, tracking systems, trying to figure out what is going on in this location. It's got a long history of sightings of werewolf, dogman creatures, you know, the kind that are in the petroglyphs right above and below in both the McConkie Ranch and Nine Mile Canyon. 
petroglyphs. And it's just not one sighting. This has been going on since the Navajo, the Utes, and then all of the new pioneer people coming, trying to farm the land and, and make it an actual ranch with cows, cow mutilations. Any kind of animals that go there get mutilated. Like, so they have a show. Um, it's I think it's on its third season called Skip Secrets at Skinwalker Ranch. And I really like the show. For one, anytime anybody tries to dig on the land, a lot of things go wrong. And people have even been, more than one person has been physically harmed from, you know, any kind of digging that they do. And then they can also monitor that there's like radioactivity, something going on underground here. And I've been saying a whole time where these cryptids hide is underground. And these were the biggest, best, strongest, toughest cryptids that must have had to go hiding in this area. This is not the place to go looking for cryptids because they already have a grudge more than the rest of them against humans. I believe, I believe this based on things like what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch. It kind of fits the pattern. And there was some theories that maybe there's um, a UFO that had crashed and buried under there. Maybe true, but I just think there's um, an extensive underground there by these cryptids who are not animals and not humans. Just think of Neanderthals, Denisovans, um, Lucy, um, Australopithecus, Gigantopithecus, all of these creatures, I could go on if I could remember some of them. Um, High Adult Brigansis. All of these human types. But they're not animals. I think they're still there. I think that they had had it out here. This was where the battle of all battles, I believe, took place when it comes to the cryptids. And they lost. The only way to win this battle is to survive. And the only way to survive is to make them stop hunting you. And the only way to do that is make them think that they killed everybody, all of you. But maybe the Navajo know that they didn't kill all of them and that's why they call that place haunted because they always thought of those cryptids as being witches and, and evil and, and things like that. I do suspect that the Fremont and the Anasazi were maybe not one species Maybe not two, maybe several or a few. Fremont National Park, and that is said to have the most petroglyphs anywhere in the state by the Fremont. Directly north of that Fremont National Park is the Great Salt Lake. It's beautiful, but it does concern me because, you know, in my research that I did of Nevada, with all those dried up lakes and looking at the outskirts of the Great Salt Lake. I'm just hoping it's not gonna be another salt and sea in the making because history is really showing that water is evaporating off the planet. It's still a beautiful gem in Utah's landscape. I'm just gonna mention one other cryptid because he's an important one in, in Utah and that is the one li living in Bear Lake. And Bear Lake is um, crosses the border between both Idaho and Utah and the cryptid there is of the serpent type and huge 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 and this lake is huge 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 I'm 250,000 years old and 200 feet deep there's all kinds of reports that people have seen and they go back to the Ute and to the Navajo so back to Skinwalker Ranch there are numerous reports of enormous intelligent humanoid creatures and UFO sightings as well. I've always wondered if paranormal activity of all types congregates together. Are these spirals representing like portals that where they come into and through and you know do the, is that what the portals represent? Because you see the portals with cryptids all the time. Or are they traps? I'm not sure. I do believe that there is something to these cryptids trying to show us that there were traps being set up for them. And I think that, like, say, Newspaper Rock, probably for hundreds of years, I think this is where the Anasazi and the Fremont, or, you know, the South and the, the South and the North, just were leaving messages back and forth for hundreds of years. So there's so many layers. And it's but this conversations 
probably like they'll go six months, who knows, three months. And then they say, what's going on down here? What's going on up there in pictures? And I think that at some point they start trying to warn each other about these circular um, snares and traps from when the Native Americans arrive. But they just couldn't match human violence. I mean, what species can really? None that we've met so far. There was obviously a war, a genocide. I don't think that it was technically a genocide because I think that the losers on this in this war, some of them escaped and still live there today and use the underground and don't like humans. Their, their ancestors would have instilled that in them. So that's why I think that place is not, the cryptids aren't friendly there. Let's put it that way. And I think there's wolf dominance there. And so looking at the werewolf physiology, you see often the tail between the legs. That's in so many of these cryptids. You also see these very shorter legs and knobby knees. These knobby knees and also very like um, pronounced calf muscles. This is very uh, werewolf leg. This looks like a werewolf leg. You've got a tail and you've got werewolf legs. No neck. You've got that check. Um, pointed ears check. Uh, snout even check. Oh, and the very triangle, you know, body like a dog has, like small waist, triangle chest, very, very werewolfy. And these, some of these petroglyphs, the ones that are fighting the humans, they look just like that. Wolf hominids. Wolf hominids. And I think they're probably pretty amazing. They didn't name themselves. Somebody named them. And for all we know, they were more than one species. But I don't think they were 100% human. There is one more thing that I forgot to mention, and that is, it's called Brewer's Cave in, Brewer's Cave in Utah. And when I put that in Google search, it came up as Crystal Ball Cave. And apparently at this site, they unearthed these artifacts that, well, the most talked about one is this one that matches the Lady of Elche, this statue unearthed, it's ancient in Spain. And, you know, because of the sides, these circular things on the sides and the look of the lady, they think it's like the same person, which is really crazy that this, you know, artifacts buried in Utah match up to these ancient artifacts buried in Spain. But they, the resemblance is uncanny. And I have wanted to, I've wanted to do a video about these circular things, you know, with the Hopi. I feel like they are um, possibly imitating something come in contact with before, but these circular things. And then also a lot of the Kachinas have them. They have these things coming out the sides. They're so um, significant that I just really have wanted to study and see if I could find out anything about what they are. And then here they are mentioned again here in Utah and Spain. So there's definitely something going on there. Like I said, there's apparently... There's all kinds of stuff in this cave, but for whatever reason, it's off limits, very dangerous, I'm sure. But they, you know, there's giants and they're saying there's giants and Egyptian artifacts and all kinds of things still in this brewer's cave. I'm just going to leave a lot of mystery to this one, but I still had to mention it. If I'm talking about cryptids, ancient history, and mystery in Utah, yes, I have to mention this. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you're interested in cryptids, then don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, bye.